All right. Um, welcome everybody to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, you know, as you know, weekly we have discussions that uh, range from uh, basic medical science to uh, clinical trials, um, but also annually we have a really fantastic lecture sponsored or um, in honor of Dr. Hirsch, uh, who is an MD and JD. Um, and I think it really enriches our, our, our programs. Uh, this year, I am thrilled to uh, have Dr. Or Elizabeth Gray. Um, Elizabeth is a graduate of Vanderbilt University, um, following which she went to GW University School of Law. Um, she then went on and did uh, further degrees in healthcare corporate compliance, um, followed by a master's of health administration. And she is uh, knowledgeable and has written about and presented on multiple topics related to, um, to healthcare in America. Um, most recently, she's been working on strengthening primary care through Medicaid managed care uh, in an age of health system transformation. Uh, but today, uh, she'll be talking to us about um, HIPAA, which is, uh, I think, one of the, the laws that's very well known, but not really well understood uh, that we have in our country, and talking about how a law that was written in one time period has to adapt um, to the information age that we find ourselves in at the current time. Uh, so with that, I will welcome Elizabeth Gray. Thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. So again, I'm Elizabeth Gray. Um, I'm a teaching assistant professor of health policy and management at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. Uh, and uh, privacy compliance and HIPAA in particular um, was my very first research focus area ever. And so um, I have a long um, history with uh, this particular law and I actually um, not love it. I'm not sure that love it is the right word for any uh, law, but I find it fascinating. I'm really glad to get a chance to speak with all of you today. So let's get started. So HIPAA is turning 25 this year, um, which is uh, really shocking. Um, the underlying HIPAA regulator, HIPAA law turns 25. And so besides being able to rent a car now, what has HIPAA accomplished in the last 25 years? How has it changed and where are we going um, from here and how do we anticipate it changing in the future? So I will be giving you a brief agenda, um, just a brief, very high level overview of HIPAA as a refresher reminder. Um, as mentioned, uh, most of you are intimately familiar with this law, uh, but uh, just doesn't hurt to get a little touch up on what it requires. Um, major changes that have been made to the HIPAA regulations in these past 25 years, particularly in the last 10. Um, and then a lot of common misconceptions, misapplications um, of the HIPAA regulations in the context of healthcare delivery. Um, what sort of remaining gaps, ongoing challenges with the law um, or areas of privacy that are not regulated, overregulated, confusingly regulated, um, and then opportunities for future changes um, to the framework that governs health information use and exchange. This is particularly relevant when we're talking about a shift to value-based care, um, as well as a pandemic and a post-pandemic world. So to get started immediately, um, how did HIPAA come to be? Uh, so HIPAA is actually sort of a two-part law. It's, it's, it's giant, uh, but the actual HIPAA law itself is the health insurance portability part, and that's actually the bulk of the law. And then the very small part of the law is the accountability part. Uh, so the his, his Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, um, and the portion of it, this is the accountability portion, mandated that the Secretary of Health and Human Services put forward regulations that govern the privacy, confidentiality, and security of patient health information, patient data, um, and in so doing, um, actually create protections that had never existed. Prior to this, um, for those of you in practice at the time or uh, who recall a pre-1996 or really 2003 period, there were very few protections governing health information besides ethics, professional responsibility, and then uh, facility and uh, provider and maybe even state regulations. 
So this is obviously a, an area that needed to be regulated. Uh, patients need to be able to share information and seek treatment, obviously. Uh, but for those patients who were very concerned about their medical information, getting back to an employer, a family member just out in general uh, was very prohibitive and kept patients from seeking necessary care. And I think all of us can empathize with that. The very first thing any of us ever were and likely the last thing any of us will ever be is a patient. And so knowing that uh, our information is protected, our information is confidential, uh, creates a, a better healthcare landscape. So this was certainly necessary, but it wasn't easy. Uh, so Congress actually said that we are going to adopt a medical privacy law, but if we don't get around to that, the Health and Human Services Secretary needs to create laws uh, governing this. And unsurprisingly, they did not adopt medical privacy uh, law, and so the secretary did create regulations. It took a long time. HIPAA was announced in 1996, signed into law in 1996. The first privacy rule that came out was in 2002. So it took a while. Um, the first two rules were the privacy rule and the security rule. Those are the ones that people are most familiar with. The HIPAA regulations basically create a federal floor for health information privacy. All of you are, again, intimately familiar with this law and other likely federal laws governing privacy as they relate to your particular practice, but HIPAA is the base. Um, we build on top of that for certain populations, certain types of information, and certain types of providers, but HIPAA is the base standard. There's even in uh, the HIPAA regulations a preemption provision that said if a state law is less protective or tries to circumvent our requirements and regulations for patient privacy, they can't. We override that, um, and that's not terribly unusual for federal laws, but the aggressiveness of that provision is pretty clear that this is the absolute bare minimum that we expect for all providers um, in all parts of the country um, for all types of patients. So. What does HIPAA actually say? This is important to know for a number of reasons besides being part of the presentation. It's also really important to understand the very fine specifics of how HIPAA defines certain things. So HIPAA, the privacy rule regulations apply only to covered entities, which is all of you, um, and their business associates, just people who work on behalf of covered entities. So legal services, actuaries, consultants, um, financial services. It protects only what is referred to as protected health information, individually identifiable uh, health information about an individual that is being held by or transmitted by a covered entity or their business associate. It does not cover information that is not identifiable. And we'll talk about why that it was a great provision for a long time and is maybe not so useful now, but it does not apply to information that is considered de-identified under the law. You can get consent to disclose any PHI from a patient, no problem. If a patient authorizes uh, disclosure to anyone for any reason, then the HIPAA law allows any disclosure of information pursuant to that authorization. It also, however, allows disclosure of patient information without the patient's authorization. So uh, people often assume that HIPAA is this really, really restrictive, very, very aggressive law, and in many ways it is. The sort of start of HIPAA says you can't disclose any patient information whatsoever without authorization or unless we tell you that you can. Those permissive exceptions, the we tell you if you can parts, are so large that you could drive a truck full of shredded medical records through them. Uh, they are designed specifically to allow the practice of medicine, the business of healthcare to continue without interruption. They've created a lot of exceptions within this rule that say you can disclose patient information for all sorts of reasons that help you be a more efficient provider um, and help our healthcare system be more efficient. Whether that actually works out um, is another question, uh, but that is really what HIPAA was designed for. So even though it, appears as a very uh, patient-centered law, and in some ways it is, giving patients those protections, and it also includes several patient rights. It really is very, or was designed to be very provider-centric. That August uh, 2002 rule, the privacy rule that came out, was met with such pushback from uh, stakeholders in healthcare delivery that it was drastically revised to be more accommodating to uh, the healthcare industry um, and healthcare providers. And so this really has created a lot of exceptions. It's just that a lot of people don't know how to fully avail themselves of them, don't know that they're there or misunderstand their application. So that makes it difficult for things to be as efficient as these regulations were designed to allow them to be. There are actually no required disclosures under HIPAA. You are never required to give information to anyone for any reason except 
to the individual themselves, um, their own information or whoever they designate as a representative or uh, somebody who is recognized under law as their representative, a patient, or I'm sorry, a parent or a guardian or someone who has um, medical power of attorney. You also have to disclose medical records to Health and Human Services if they come in for an audit. Um, these don't happen terribly often, and so the most common required disclosure is to the individual. Other than that, you are not compelled to disclose anything, even if you are allowed to. And that's a key point that I like to emphasize whenever I talk about HIPAA. These are permissive disclosures. You can, it doesn't mean that you must, and it also doesn't necessarily mean that you should, but it means that you can. So those are sort of the very high levels. Um, this talks a little bit more about some of those permissive disclosures, what you can uh, disclose information for without the patient's authorization ahead of time. So you can disclose to another provider for treatment purposes. You can disclose to a health insurer uh, for payment purposes. You can disclose to other covered entities or really pretty much anyone for purposes of your own healthcare operations. This is like Population health, population health management, uh, care coordination, um, quality improvement activities, um, all kinds of business purposes. This is a very, very long list of things um, and the health operations exception is often what's used um, for the non-patient fa fa facing part of any healthcare facility to make improvements to the facility um, and conduct business sort of away from the actual um, doctor's office clinic room. In addition to those three, the TPO, treatment payment operations disclosures, which are the most common and most frequently used, you also have what are referred to as incident to, a permitted use and disclosure. Whenever I talk about um, HIPAA with any of my students, um, I always ask how many of them have ever been in, for example, a pharmacy and heard somebody's name called over a loudspeaker or have ever been to a hospital or a doctor's office and signed in on a sheet and seen other people's names on it. Um, or just looked around a waiting room and seen other people's faces. And of course, everyone raises their hands. These are what are referred to as incident to disclosures. You can't uh, do everything completely, confidential, uh, completely confidentially. So it's really important to be able to have a few situations where if somebody overhears something or sees something um, that's sort of part of doing business, that that's not considered an inappropriate disclosure. Then we have what are referred to as the public benefit disclosures. These are myriad. They take up several pages of regulatory text. There are so many of them. Um, the ones that are probably most relevant, particularly right now, relate to disclosures that a state might require of a facility. So, you know, abuse and neglect reporting, um, various healthcare compliance requirements, um, and then the public health disclosures. Um, these are vast, um, and it allows any provider to disclose to an authorized state uh, public health entity for purposes of tracking disease, managing disease, um, treating patients, contact tracing, all of that. That's part of these disclosures and that's allowed. There are other uh, public benefit disclosures related to employment, uh, related to law enforcement, national security, armed forces exceptions, um, and some other business related exceptions. You can also disclose health information for certain research purposes um, and certain circumstances where the individual patient doesn't necessarily sign an authorization form, but where they're given an opportunity to object to a disclosure. So I'm sure for all of you, you have many, many times been in a patient room or with a patient and they have invited family members in um, to listen in. The providers allowed to basically assume that if they have asked the family to come in and given the opportunity to ask the family to leave, they don't, that you can then share patient information with everyone in the room um, without violating HIPAA, even though technically you would otherwise have to have some kind of written authorization from the patient. Disclosures beyond that require patient authorization, but like I said, that covers a vast, vast, vast amount of the circumstances one could ever hope to be in and that would need disclosure of um, health information. Most of these disclosures are subject to what's referred to as the minimum necessary standard or limitation. You guys are also all familiar with this. Any HIPAA training would include it. You can't just hand over a giant stack of medical records when we once had paper medical records to somebody who's asking for them for purposes of quality improvement. It would have to be pulled the very small amount of information from there that would be necessary for that purpose and nothing more than that. Not all of the permissive disclosures have the minimum necessary limitation. A really key one is that disclosures for purposes of treatment don't. So you could hand over an entire medical record for a patient 
going back however many decades the patient's information existed and hand it over to a new provider or um, a part of a care team for purposes of that patient's treatment. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Uh, the minimum necessary limitation is sort of how they balanced all of these massive disclosure um, exceptions um, to try to limit how much information can actually get out there for the purposes of um, disclosure when you're permitted to do it. So HIPAA enforcement, um, this is more of an issue for your compliance departments and your legal departments um, because it is uh, something that is related primarily to organizational compliance and enforcement. Um, while the Office for Civil Rights, which enforces um, the HIPAA provisions and refers um, cases of criminal noncompliance um, to the Department of Justice, very rarely do they go after an individual provider. Um, it is almost always an organization, um, and not only because it, those are deeper pockets, um, but because there tend to be many more violations for an organization as opposed to a single provider. Uh, they do investigate these. They receive complaints directly from anyone. They have a basically tip line uh, that you can send in um, information about possible HIPAA noncompliance. As you might imagine, the uh, Office for Civil Rights receives a huge number of uh, accusations of noncompliance with HIPAA. And the vast majority of them are not actually um, noncompliance with HIPAA. When patients or other providers submit information about this, OCR does their best to investigate any complaint that is um, raised, but oftentimes it is not actually a violation of HIPAA. Um, mostly HIPAA enforcement is centered around things related to um, breaches of security, so not having um, appropriate safeguards on computers and EMRs, not having appropriate um, physical safeguards in records rooms, server rooms, those kinds of things. Those tend to be the focus of enforcement activity, as well as just large breaches um, where individuals' um, information has gone, gotten out in huge volumes. Um, an example of this that I always like to share, although it was unfortunate, um, I grew up in Ohio um, and had was born in and visited um, the Ohio State University Western Medical Center for all of my care growing up. And when I was about 25, um, an, an intern at the, the hospital, um, not even, I think, a physician intern, uh, but an administrative intern, took home a laptop um, that happened to be connected to the entire uh, medical record system at Ohio State, left it in their car, and it got stolen. That's considered a breach because the information is then out there, and Ohio State had to pay for every single patient that they had to get life lock protection for, I think, a decade. Um, so that's basically how breach, uh, breaches happen and what enforcement activities are related to that to sort of rectify those kinds of problems. Um, because an intern shouldn't be taking a laptop home and they shouldn't be leaving it in their car. Um, so that's a violation of the security rule. Uh, some laws have changed the penalty structure. When HIPAA was first introduced, wasn't very aggressive. Uh, this was not considered a high com compliance priority for many, many years. Uh, the penalties were rather low. Um, it was not an enforcement priority for health and human services. Uh, and so it sort of took the back burner. Uh, with some changes made um, by high tech, which I'll talk about in just a second in more detail, uh, the ex penalties expanded drastically. And all of a sudden HIPAA went from this very low level concern for the most part um, from a compliance perspective to the forefront of, of seriousness uh, and has stayed there. Um, penalties are, when you read lawsuits or information in the news about HIPAA violations, penalties often are levied in the multi-millions of dollars um, for each violation. The base penalty would start at about $50,000. It's actually a little bit more. Um, it's adjust up every single year. And if you have a disclosure of one single patient's medical record because a laptop has been stolen out of someone's car, you have a disclosure of thousands of people's medical records. And at $50,000 a piece, you can imagine how fines start to stack up. So this, this really did give teeth to HIPAA. But one really, really important thing, and uh, this is a key thing that is probably one of the biggest misconceptions about HIPAA. There is no private right of action under HIPAA. That means that an individual whose information has been improperly disclosed um, or who has not been given access to their medical records as required, they can't sue the provider. There is no ability under HIPAA for an individual to sue a provider, a facility, or anything else. Uh, 
States can give their uh, residents the ability to uh, sue a hospital or a provider or other type of facility. And as you might imagine, most states do not give that uh, right to patients or to individuals. So uh, that leaves the enforcement um, interest primarily squared with the federal government uh, and patients can submit complaints. Uh, they theoretically could sue for other violations that may be stemming from the HIPAA violation that relate to their personal rights, but there's no private right of action to be sued under HIPAA. Not that that means people shouldn't be compliant with it but because they have less individual liability and less individual risk, but there is no right to sue um, under HIPAA. That was actually very clearly requested and created when revising the HIPAA privacy rules uh, to sort of avoid other means of litigation, um, given that there are so many um, in the healthcare space already. So that sort of wraps up um, the HIPAA background a little, um, as it were, um, and what HIPAA basically looked like um, up until some major changes started to, to roll out, um, again, about 10 years ago. Um, so there were a few small changes made to the HIPAA provisions from the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act of 2005 and the Genetic Information Non-Disclosure Act of 2008. Those are relatively minor. They have more to do um, with uh, other stakeholders, not providers. Um, and so HIPAA otherwise remained relatively unchanged. Until 2009, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, or High Tech Act, for those of you who are intimately familiar with Meaningful Use Program um, that has since been sunsetted, this was the law that brought meaningful use into play. Uh, so the High Tech Act was part of the stimulus bill, and it made major changes to HIPAA, major. Um, revamped almost the entire thing. Um, so high tech came out in 2009. The changes were not formalized until 2013. Things take a little while, um, especially when you're dealing with complex regulations like this. Uh, so, uh, but the high tech changes added that breach notification rule that you had to let patients know if somebody's laptop was stolen out of the back of their car. Uh, they enhanced those enforcement rule provisions. They expanded the definition of what a business associate is and increased the liability for covered entities for violations of HIPAA by their business associates. Um, they changed a bunch of the rules related to the sale of PHI, the marketing of um, health services using PHI and fundraising um, that would be uh, related to accessing patient information. They also significantly expanded patient rights. Um, without providing a lot of detail, uh, they basically just said providers have to make it easier um, for patients to access their information. And it's been a long time um, that uh, the federal government has been working on defining what that exactly means and what that requires, but the uh, increase in patient rights was a key part of the high tech provisions. The Affordable Care Act also made some changes to HIPAA, but nothing related to the privacy rule, um, mostly about uh, standardizing claims and um, the use of electronic systems to um, submit uh, various required um, health insurance related um, data. Uh, the HIPAA right of access initiative is sort of the most recent um, change. So this isn't a law. Um, this was an initiative, an initiative launched under the Trump administration, but it remains ongoing and a priority for the Office for Civil Rights. It basically enhances um, the, the expectations for providers in relation to giving patients access to their own information. Again, remember that that's the only, um, besides uh, compliance related disclosures to Health and Human Services directly, that is the only required disclosure under HIPAA uh, to pay, give patients access to their information. And this has been a uh, key point of contention for stakeholders, patient advocates, et cetera, um, who want to make it easier for patients to get access to records because patients still report enormous difficulty with accessing their information, um, whether it's because they're being charged a huge amount of money uh, for copies of their records. Um, it's taking weeks or months to get their information when they need it in a much shorter time frame, um, or they're told that they are not permitted to access that information, which again is a HIPAA violation. So the HIPAA right of access initiative is trying to resolve that. Um, and the Office for Civil Rights very proudly announces every time they settle a lawsuit um, related to the right of access initiative. I think they've had 21 settlements so far this year related to facilities and providers that have uh, not followed the rules in terms of getting patients their information. Other changes. 
So for a long time, HIPAA laid dormant. 2013, they made these massive changes via the uh, high tech rule, and it's been sort of uh, an increasing volume of changes ever since. Um, so the 21st Century Cures Act, um, which was signed in 2016, but these provisions didn't go into effect until 2021, and some still remain to go into effect, had all kinds of changes, again, expanding the patient access to information, um, enhancing access to PHI for purposes of research, um, and information blocking prohibitions. So the information blocking prohibitions are really interesting. The inf information blocking prohibitions uh, grew out of uh, concern that organizations and stakeholders were implementing technology, EHRs, EMRs, um, other related patient tools, um, and denying access to that information and refusing to share that information with other providers, maybe in um, a multidisciplinary care team, or that a patient requests um, their information be sent to. The, this is termed information blocking and providers, facilities, et cetera, can get in a lot of trouble um, now for blocking information. Uh, any organization who deploys their new technologies in a way that um, will tend to limit, um, you know, care coordination or uh, care delivery that relies on the use of health information technology is considered information blocking. There are a few exceptions to this, but it really does um, push providers to open up uh, their information a little bit more to patients and to other providers um, and make data flow much more easily and uh, occur more frequently. Um, the CMS interoperability and patient access rule was signed in March 2020. It was part of the Trump administration's My Health eData initiative. Most of these were related to technical changes um, required um, of providers and payers, but some of key provisions are that uh, under this new rule, um, payers are required to exchange clinical data at the patient's request with third parties, with other payers, um, and they're required to share that information. Previously, this was really locked down. Payers very rarely gave information out to anyone for any reason, uh, and so this requirement really has enhanced that um, opportunity for information sharing and information collection. Um, in addition, health insurers are required to share cost information with third party apps, um, and it requires that providers send some patient information to other providers automatically, mostly related to discharge to other facilities that um, patient information is then sent to the new facility, new provider automatically. There's been a lot of pushback about some of those. Anything that requires providers to, to share patient information automatically um, or in all circumstances raises huge red flags for privacy advocates, as well as huge red flags for providers uh, who may not find it in the best interest to share all of that information um, or don't know exactly how to get that information out. Um, and so obligating providers to do this is definitely a concern that will have to be rectified in the future. There was also a HIPAA safe harbor published in the beginning of January of this year. It mostly changes um, security rule provisions and relaxes a lot of them. And this is mostly in light of the COVID pandemic. So there's some proposed changes too. Um, it, <laughs> Health and Human Services issued a request for information in December of 2018, asking the in healthcare industry, what would you like to see different about HIPAA? You can imagine that they received a lot of comments. Uh, so they published a proposed rule um, that modifies HIPAA in December of 2020. Um, that rule has now laid stagnant. They have finished um, getting comments on that particular rule, and it's not clear whether they will go forward with implementing anything from that rule um, or go back to the drawing board on changes to make. This really, uh, the, the NPRM or proposed rule, um, really stemmed from the Trump administration's regulatory sprint to coordinated care. For those of you who are not familiar, the um, Department of Health and Human Services vowed uh, to eliminate two regulations for each, for each single regulation that was created. So two out for every one in. This regulatory sprint was intended to streamline healthcare requirements. And so any opportunity to eliminate requirements or reduce uh, rules and regulations um, were seized upon. So this is where this kind of grows out from um, and relaxes a lot of standards under HIPAA um, for providers, um, removes the minimum necessary requirement for care coordination purposes, um, enhances the definition of healthcare operations to include a lot of information about care coordination, care case management for individuals as opposed to entire populations. 
um, and relaxed a lot of the standards for some of these permissive disclosures, um, rather than requiring things like an imminent uh, danger um, to health and safety um, for providers to disclose to an authority. It could just be a reasonably foreseeable danger in the sometime distant future that enables a provider to share that information with law enforcement, another provider, um, other organizations. It also enables disclosures to several social service agencies, community-based organizations, um, and other sort of uh, ancillary services um, that help provide care coordination and case management for patients who are complex or in particularly vulnerable situations. So these proposed changes, again, we don't know where they're going. Um, a lot of them were welcome, some of them not so much. Um, but again, uh, there have been a lot of proposed changes to HIPAA in the last five years alone. So we'll see what happens um, with that. But these are some changes that are potentially on the horizon. Um, and some of them would certainly make it a lot easier um, to, to manage a patient's care across multiple providers and multiple different facilities. So HIPAA and COVID. Um, everything has changed under COVID, and I certainly don't need to tell any of you that. Uh, the changes that have been made to HIPAA primarily permit access um, or permit the use of telehealth technologies that may not meet the normal standards for telehealth, um, allows business associates to make disclosures of health information for public health purposes. You can allow business associates to disclose information related to reporting COVID to the state um, or localities. Um, and um, expanded the number of times or situations where um, a provider has to disclose information or can disclose information with a non-covered entity. Uh, so enables um, providers to share information about a patient's COVID status, for example, with emergency medical technicians um, or uh, law enforcement um, to alert them that they need to increase the use of PPE um, or possibly go um, and get tested for exposure to COVID. Uh, so that was some of the primary major changes to this. For those of you who work now or ever have worked in substance use treatment disorder, substance use disorder treatment, uh, changes related to rules governing those types of patient records were made to align it with HIPAA. People who work in that space, um, the law is referred to as Part 2, 42 CFR Part 2. People who work in the substance use disorder treatment space really were quite upset about changes that were made um, to that regulation under the CARES Act. Um, it really, really, really reduces the protection, the confidentiality protections for those patients um, who are extremely vulnerable um, and are much more likely to refuse to seek care out of concern that their information may be shared with people they don't want information shared with. Uh, the CARES Act basically lifted a lot of those protections and made this particular rule almost identical to HIPAA in many ways. That may get changed back in the future, but that was the biggest shift. Um, and it sort of happened without anybody really noticing it. The CARES Act was a stimulus bill. Um, and so tossing these medical um, health information provisions in them was a little sneaky uh, and was not really sort of part um, of the intention of it, although certainly making it easier for providers to share information, get access to information was important. But we'll see where that ends up after um, the law has been in place now for a year or two. Um, in addition uh, to all of those changes, um, the law clarified that protected health information could be used for public health disclosures, health oversight activities. The trick is that that's nothing new that existed in the previous rule. So a lot of people have treated that as a change to HIPAA, and it's not. It just is reiterating what HIPAA already said. You could already make disclosures of um, protected health information uh, to public health entities uh, for valid public health purposes without a patient's authorization. That happened before COVID, it stayed through COVID, and it will remain after COVID. So, that's the changes. This is where HIPAA has been, where it's possibly going. Um, and uh, there are a lot of future changes on the horizon. Um, we'll talk about some gaps and challenges that remain with the law in particular. Uh, but again, there's been a flurry of legislative and, um, and administrative activity related to governing um, health information. And we will continue to see that um, increase as more people focus on information related uh, to their health, especially in light of COVID.
But now I'd like to talk about some of the HIPAA myths and misconceptions. So I enjoyed this. So I'm sure all of you are very aware of this, but everyone on the internet is an expert on HIPAA. Um, my, one of my favorite things to do is uh, declare anything I don't like um, as a HIPAA violation filing my taxes, uh, going to meetings instead of getting emails, uh, when Netflix asks me if I'm still watching, all a HIPAA violation. So HIPAA is really, really poorly understood um, outside of the healthcare space, um, but also sometimes even within uh, healthcare delivery, healthcare and by healthcare providers. Um, oftentimes, uh, healthcare providers tend to take a far more um, risk averse approach uh, to healthcare disclosures, which is uh, allowed um, unless it relates to giving an individual their own information. Um, but providers don't necessarily need to restrict the information um, to the degree that they often do. Uh, so HIPAA versus HIPAA. Um, you can always tell when someone's a HIPAA expert because they spell it with two P's instead of two A's. Uh, but HIPAA obviously doesn't apply to retail settings, to restaurants. Um, to information an individual puts on social media um, or uh, things like mask mandates or vaccine passports or requirements. So, uh, but nonetheless, um, we'll continue to hear uh, HIPAA invoked as a sort of catch all for things I don't like to do um, that relate to my personal information, health related or otherwise. But here are some actual common HIPAA issues that we see um, often um, in healthcare delivery. Um, most of these were actually drawn um, from an article that I worked on with a GW physician um, who identified sort of 10 key areas uh, that impact emergency department physicians in particular, but are actually applicable to pretty much all care settings uh, that come up that providers face often and their sort of murky guidance around what these are. So things like a family member calling in, asking about a patient, their brother, their spouse, their, their daughter, um, identifying the patient by name and asking what their status is, where they are, what's going on. Um, a person who calls a provider and says, I'm their other provider, can I get information about the patient, what's their status? A patient in a hospital bed um, in the hallway, um, and certainly this would be occurring with far more frequency now in the last year, um, but where their medical information is overheard by another patient who's possibly also in the hallway or passing through. You often also see this in ER bays, uh, where there's a curtain separating bays and you can hear um, what's happening in the next, um, in the next area, um, and so medical information can be um, overheard that way and thus disclosed to someone who's technically not supposed to have it. Um, a physician calling another provider or a facility, trying desperately to get medical records on their patient, be it, but being refused access to those medical records and the entity insisting that the physician calling require get the patient's written authorization before they will share any information about the patient. Um, occasions where the patient has a serious diagnosis, diagnosis, but the family asks the provider not to share that diagnosis because they believe the patient can't handle it. When police bring a patient in um, and then after the patient's um, resuscitated or after a procedure finishes um, or after tests are run and asks about the status of that particular patient. Uh, cases where a supervisor um, or colleague brings a patient in um, or employee in for a medical issue and then asks for an update on the patient's condition from the physician. Finally, situations where a physician or other provider may occasionally log in on the EMR to check the status of a VIP patient who has been brought into the emergency room or who is otherwise there for procedure out of curiosity. So I'm not gonna ask you guys to tell me which of these things that you would actually be allowed to do without really doing anything else. Um, but if anybody wants to take a guess as to which of these things you absolutely cannot do ever, is it all of them? Is it most of them? Um, especially for those of you who may have ever experienced um, these particular issues, possibly more than once. Um, but these are also very common. And I'll give you a hint that uh, not everything on here is prohibited under HIPAA. In fact, there are several things on here that are allowed. I'll give the first one. This isn't allowed. This actually doesn't really have to do with HIPAA um, at all. It's not a HIPAA issue. Um, the provider um, 
is the only part that would make this a HIPAA issue is the fact that the patient is entitled to their own health information. That's usually interpreted as the patient requesting their health information. So this really has more to do with medical ethics, um, professional judgment, um, and other requirements related to um, sharing information with a patient and using um, best judgment in those circumstances. So while this may be common, this is actually not really something that would be under a HIPAA policy or a procedure. The other item the that's- The third one is not covered, right? The third one, the patient seen in a hospital bed and their medical record. Bed, yeah. Yeah, so this actually is very likely to be what that incident to type of disclosure, the, the type of disclosure that just kind of happens in the process of delivering healthcare. Sometimes these kinds of things um, can't be helped. The only way that this would be a prohibited um, disclosure is if the, the physician, the facility, sort of blatantly didn't take any precautions to try to limit that disclosure. Um, so just, you know, providers sitting out in the hallway surrounded by patients having lengthy discussions about a patient's medical record is not going to be something that's acceptable. But a patient overhearing a doctor speaking quietly to a patient in the hallway about their medical information, that's actually going to just be an incident to disclosure and it is going to be permitted. Um, I'll also emphasize another key point, not that I would ever encourage people to not follow the rules just because you're not going to get caught. But in that particular situation, it's very unlikely that a patient who overhears something is going to report that. You can't get in trouble under HIPAA unless somebody tells on you. Uh, so again, this is not this is not likely to actually be a HIPAA violation. But even if it were, the likelihood of it being a compliance, a high priority compliance issue, is relatively low, um, given the sort of the risk um, of discovery. Um, but again, this is very unlikely to be a HIPAA violation unless the physician was shouting down the hallway um, at length to somebody else um, for all to hear. So those are the only two that are actually prohibited. Um, this one I put in yellow, which you of course now can't see, um, but the supervisor bringing an employee in. You can make disclosures to employers about their employees for like workers' compensation purposes and some other very limited purposes. But unless the supervisor is a, you know, is helping to take care of the employee and needs information about follow-up care that they may need to receive, it's very likely that they can't receive an update about their employee unless the update is just, they're stable, they're still here, that's it. Um, so that's probably um, not going to be okay under HIPAA, but that's it. Everything else is either a permitted disclosure um, or would be a permitted disclosure assuming that um, it complied with your own policies and procedures, um, the medical information given was limited um, to the minimum necessary. Um, almost all of that would be fine. Again, I'll point out that these are permissive disclosures. So the physician calling another provider or facility trying to get medical records and being denied them, that makes the business of healthcare very difficult, but it's not a HIPAA violation. Um, the and other entity is not required to share information with that provider uh, for treatment purposes, even though they can. Where it would become a HIPAA violation is if the patient themselves called their former provider and said, send my information to my new doctor, thank you. And the entity said, I won't do that um, unless you sign this very, very specific form. That's a HIPAA violation, but that's it. Um, if it was just the provider calling them up and saying, I'm treating your former patient or current patient, please send me information relevant to that care and we're told no, that's allowed. Um, we would just hope that that doesn't necessarily always happen. So what remains after this? Um, where, are, where is HIPAA still not covering things? Where is HIPAA still not um, appropriately addressing problems? So there are obviously a lot of regulations out there on both the federal and state level, and sometimes they conflict. Yes, HIPAA is supposed to be a federal core. It's supposed to be the bare minimum, and it overrides any state law that's less protective of patient rights. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily clear to everyone when a federal law is more protective than HIPAA or less, whether a state law is more or less, um, where states add additional privacy requirements. Um, sometimes these create um, you know, additional obligations that make things very, very, very challenging to actually implement and understand. 
This is one of the key things that, from a policy perspective, needs to be addressed and unwound. Uh, by having all of this complex uh, regulatory structure, it makes providers, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this, completely reticent to disclose anything for any reason. They disclose to what they have to, to the patient, to Health and Human Services, and that's it, just to make it a blanket policy to otherwise never share information. That's easier. A no is always going to be easier in that particular circumstance. But that creates other huge problems. There is a significant need for health information in all kinds of healthcare delivery contexts. In addition, implementing value-based care, improving research, uh, improving care coordination, all of that requires robust information sharing. And if providers are feeling like there are too many regulations, I think I'm violating the regulations at one every step that I take, so I'm just not going to do anything, that itself is a problem. So that's a, a big area um, that needs to be addressed. There are some proposed rules that we already talked about um, and some of the uh, earlier changes that try to get at this. Um, but even where they try to reduce regulations complexity by uh, addressing them via regulation, you tend to create even more complexity. Uh, so doing this piecemeal is also a big problem because it adds to that, that challenge to that difficulty. Other federal privacy requirements in particular also create some challenges because you might have enhanced privacy protections required just for certain types of patients. Uh, so certainly when you are treating a minor, there are additional privacy protections. When you are treating, um, in some states, when you are treating somebody who, um, is, uh, who is elderly and has been uh, designated as um, an incompetent under state law, a term that I can't stand using, but that's the uh, formal legal term, there are enhanced privacy protections. Substance use treatment, enhanced privacy protections, and often states impose additional privacy protections for um, mental health information. So you might have additional requirements in one single day for a handful of patients that some apply to some patients and others don't, and this creates even more complexity. Uh, there's also a level of organizational and personal risk tolerance um, to HIPAA that makes a big difference. If your organization is very risk averse and, and errs on that side of, no, we're not telling anybody anything because it's just easier that way, then that becomes the organizational policy, the organizational value, and treats health information differently than other providers might and can. If you are personally or organizationally very risk tolerant, uh, there is likely to be many more situations where you are willing to assess the privacy regulations and say, yes, I'm pretty sure that what I'm disclosing satisfies the healthcare operations disclosures or is a public health um, disclosure that's appropriate under those. So that level of risk tolerance makes a huge difference and there's really nothing that we can do to mandate that or change it. The only thing that can really be done is to meet people where they are and make changes to the rule in a way that um, assumes that everyone is completely risk averse um, and we need to be designing rules to make even the most cautious of organizations and people willing to share information. Things like defining a business associate, which is more of a concern for a compliance department, as well as authorization requirements for patients um, that actually do, do complete them and want their information shared, um, how to, you know, how to create those, what they should say, how to collect that information, um, and then emerging issues related to research, things like the use of big data in both delivery and research, um, the involvement of third-party stakeholders, app makers. Um, there's been a huge amount of involvement with app developers um, and other sort of outside outsider stakeholders who are getting into the healthcare space and how HIPAA regulates all of that is very up in the air because when HIPAA was created, as mentioned earlier, it was created in a time where the cutting edge technology in terms of sharing health information was a fax machine. And HIPAA still really addresses, HIPAA still uses the term fax machine in multiple places, far more than it uses really any other um, technology related term. Fax machines are, you know, still useful, I suppose, but this is not really relevant for the uh, the vast and quick changing of our technology landscape, HIPAA is not able to keep up with that. So making changes to it that reflect how quickly technology changes and shifts um, and how other requirements that may be implemented related to that technology need to uh, fit within a, health, a HIPAA framework that makes sense. So there are a lot of changes that are still necessary. Um, 
you don't want to make things so vague to allow just about anything to happen, uh, but a lot of changes are needed to be made, even just to reflect um, how different technology is between now and 25 years ago when HIPAA um, was first brought forth. So what's next? Uh, the shift to value-based care delivery, which depending on who you talk to is not happening or is happening really, really quickly. Uh, the shift to value-based care delivery will really highlight the need to make continued changes to HIPAA. Care coordination is a key part of an efficient value-based care delivery system and an efficient uh, value-based payment system. Uh, and in order to coordinate care, you need information. Multidisciplinary teams uh, don't always work under the same roof, and so you need to be able to share information quickly, easily, and completely amongst everyone who needs that information, and it's not just so easy as sending an email to someone or picking up a phone and calling them. So the shift to value-based care delivery will really rely on robust information sharing. Patient-centered care, which is a key component of all of the discussions surrounding value-based care, requires patient information. If you want a patient to be involved, to understand their care, to take the steps that they need to take, um, then they, you both need their information and you need to be able to share that information with them and other people that they have decided to involve in their care who are outside the healthcare space, like family, friends, and other caretakers. So the shift to value-based care is, a, is a, an opportunity for change um, and not just an opportunity will really necessitate change. There have been a number of other federal rules that have changed very recently to reflect this. The fraud and abuse framework itself has changed drastically. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with um, or have at least heard the term of the Stark Law or the anti-kickback statute. Those really had to make huge changes, which also happened in January of this year, to allow for um, value-based care concepts that weren't contemplated when these original laws were created. In a pandemic world, which you certainly see, uh, telehealth, the need to share electri um, information electronically um, has really, really uh, grown. Um, and while the need won't necessarily stay where it has been, um, and who knows for how much longer that may be, if at all, uh, the, the efficiency of telehealth in certain circumstances will really push uh, the federal government to reconsider some of the limitations um, that HIPAA puts in place so that they can actually allow um, telehealth to occur um, in situations where it's necessary. Public health disclosures are obviously happening. As I mentioned, you are always allowed to disclose uh, health information about a patient for public health purposes, but people are paying attention now. You're certainly going to have your people in anonymous YouTube comment sections who will say that disclosures to public health agencies um, is a violation of HIPAA with two Ps. Uh, but nonetheless, public health disclosures um, have really come to the forefront. Um, and ideally, relationships have been created between facilities, providers, and public health agencies to more readily share information. I'm not sure that that's happened in every single place, um, but that's at least something that people are paying a little bit more attention to. A post-pandemic world, I hate to even say that, I feel I should knock on some kind of wood, uh, but a post-pandemic world will continue to create situations where HIPAA needs to be revised. Vaccine-related information, whether that's vaccine passports, getting booster shots, um, confirming vaccination status in various um, private and, and public institutions like schools and universities, that will be a huge shift. Um, as technology continues to grow, um, as people become more um, used to using apps to control their health, to communicate with their providers, HIPAA will absolutely need to change. So there's a huge opportunity um, for HIPAA to grow um, and to sort of come out from its first 25 years into its, its next 25 years um, and, and really be more flexible and adaptable to a rapidly changing world um, that changes in many different ways very quickly um, with every passing month and year. And HIPAA is very much still stuck in, I'd say, mid-2000s. Um, so maybe like the 2005 era is really where it would shine. Um, and our world looks nothing like that um, in terms of technology um, and what patients expect and what payers are doing um, and what just the healthcare system continues to evolve to be. So for provider purposes, there are a lot of opportunities here. Um, I'm sure all of you have an abundance of free time that you don't know what to do with, but um, anytime that there is a request for information or an opportunity for comment on a proposed rule, the comments that the federal government listens to the most are comments from providers. Uh, that's what they tend to give more weight to. 
So anytime there's an opportunity to submit uh, feedback um, or input on those, and those opportunities are actually not very rare. They happen multiple times a, a year um, in many settings. I would encourage any of you who feel so inclined to always try to submit um, input on that uh, because the people who are making these rules are so separated from the actual practice of healthcare delivery uh, that any input from stakeholders um, who are in that space is really valued and really important. I think also taking a very sort of public stance um, about what kind of health information sharing is necessary and what it can accomplish um, is also really critical. People need to know why patient information needs to be shared beyond just for you know sharing with another provider for treatment, for payment, those kinds of things. What kind of discoveries, what kind of innovations, what kind of efficiencies could be, could be had if more information was readily available and more easily shared? And I think that um, physicians in particular are in, a, are in a position to be able to speak knowledgeably um, on that subject. Uh, and that kind of information is helpful. So if you get outreach from, from media, have an opportunity to speak at conferences or engage with others um, about this to really sort of emphasize that um, and plant those seeds in people's heads. I think uh, continuing to understand what HIPAA does and doesn't say, even if that's pushing your own organizations or your colleagues to be perhaps a little bit more uh, risk tolerant or to reconsider policies and procedures that may be more restrictive than HIPAA would require um, and perhaps pushing um, for those to be lifted a bit or to be reconsidered to allow more information sharing both internally and externally to your organization. Those are just a few things uh, that we have heard from um, or that I have heard from uh, federal stakeholders and private stakeholders who are outside the healthcare delivery space, but would certainly also welcome any um, any suggestions that anyone would ever have about how to improve HIPAA um, or what needs to be done or what misunderstandings and misconceptions are still in place. Uh, just understanding the law itself without making any changes to it is also really key. Uh, and uh, even though I'm sure you all have regular HIPAA training, uh, really understanding those actual real world situations and when you could disclose and when you can't is also really critical. So that really does bring us pretty much to time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if anyone ever has any questions, I invite you to please reach out to me. I, here's my email. Um, it's been such a pleasure talking with you um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, and I, I hope that, uh, when you hear the word HIPAA, that it's not doesn't send shivers down your spine um, or cause too much annoyance, uh, but that you continue to figure out how to operate within the confines of HIPAA to the extent that it allows.